Hi, everybody. Welcome to our University Readiness Webinar. My name is Ruth Rumack. I am the Executive Director of Education at Ruth Rumack's Learning Space, and I am very happy that you are joining me this evening on this very cold Toronto evening. I'm not sure where you're coming from, but it's cold here, that's for sure. So uh, welcome. I'm so glad that you've made it, and I would love if we could begin, if you feel comfortable putting into the chat uh, the ages of the kids that you're thinking of, are they in grade 11 this year, grade 12 this year, um, where they've been accepted to university, if they've already been accepted, although I guess wouldn't happen so right now, but where they're thinking of going to university, um, just so we can get a handle on, on who we're talking about and, and um, who we're talking with today. So go ahead and put that in the chat. That would be wonderful. I'll just explain a little bit about this evening. Um, we're going to talk about many things, university readiness and getting ready for that transition. And there will be certain points where I pause and I will take your questions. I'll be happy to answer questions on that section. And then at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna leave some time so that we can have a further chat if you have further questions that weren't answered or things that came up for you while we're, while we're chatting. Um, if you have any other comments to make, I'd love to have them in the chat as well. And uh, keep in mind, I will ask you at the end of the presentation for at least one thing that you found helpful or interesting or something that you didn't know or something that you're gonna take away with you. So keep that in mind. I am gonna ask that at the end. I, I am a teacher after all. I have to ask self-reflective -re questions. That's the name of the game. So let's take a look at the chat. We've got, um, Lynn has a grade 12 student going to Huron McMaster, Queens, Western McGill. So lots of choices there. Um, and Altman says grade 12 uh, for hardware engineering in Ontario University, lovely. Um, Matt is also grade 12 daughter applied to schools in New York City and Toronto. So I guess Matt, your daughter would be taking the SATs as well or the ACTs. Uh, Erica, grade 12 applying to Humber College in York U. Christine, grade 12 student offered uh, at York UNUTSC, oh, wonderful. And John says, hi, Ruth, my boys are in grade 11 and 12 and Caitlin, grade 12, accepted to Huron College Western for Humanities, Carleton Public Administration Policy Management. It's, oh my goodness, lots of offers again. And Sue, a grade 12 daughter has applied to Concordia, Carleton and Ryerson, fabulous. So it looks to me like we are all kind of in the grade 12 boat. So we are watching our kids get ready to really make that transition over the next few months. And how do we feel as parents? Put that in the chat as well. Let me know, how are you feeling? One, two, three words. What are your thoughts and feelings and emotions? Uh, it's probably a varied bag, a mixed bag, but I would love to know how you're feeling about it at this moment. What have we got? Excited and worried, nervous, yes. Yes, how many people are feeling like, oh my gosh, my baby's going off to school and I don't know if they're ready. We could be feeling that too, anxious and excited, nervous, stressed. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you. I'm definitely hearing you. All right, and just out of curiosity, if you've had conversations with your kids about it, how are they feeling? How are, you, how are your kids feeling about going off? Um, whether they're staying in Toronto or on, on Ontario or they're going abroad. Um, we also have worried, hoping that all goes well, happy for him to move on. Yes, sums it up, doesn't it? But let us know how your kids are feeling. Sen is very excited to move on. Yeah, I think, you know, we're going to talk about this. That the last two years has certainly given us some huh, pause for reflection and given us some opportunities to think about what we really want in the future um, and also figuring out how to be resilient. So I think that's going to come in handy too. Let's see, we've got Kids are um, sad to leave high school, nervous and excited, unsure, underestimating the executive functioning challenges, but excited, yes. <laughs> We're gonna talk about executive functions for sure. Um, Christine says, Julian wants to stay at home, but hasn't been really uh, able to realize what comes next, yes. Okay, excellent. Some feelings of indifference, and it's hard to, for uh, uh, one of the kids to express their feelings, which I can appreciate too, because there's a lot going on. That transition is challenging and it's a big transition and it's a life transition. And I think as we grow up and we prepare our kids to get to this point of finishing grade 12 and moving on to post-secondary, whatever that is, um, there is a lot of, um, we put a lot of eggs in one basket in some way. And I think 
part of what I've realized as an adult is that it wasn't make or break in grade 12, that, you know, grade 12 was definitely a, a very challenging year and, and a year of, of really a lot of excitement as well, but there are always opportunities in the future. So, you know, I, I try and tell my, my grade 12 students, like, just relax a little bit because Whatever choice you make now, you can follow through with, and then you can make another choice at another time and follow through with that as well too. The, I guess the question is making some type of choice as opposed to just staying inert. All right, let's start our presentation. So for those of you who have just joined us, again, my name is Ruth Rumack. I am the Executive Director of Education at Ruth Rumax Learning Space. We are a direct instruction pedagogy, full service academic support center. Some of you may know of our services and some of you may be new to our services. Uh, all of our teachers are certified teachers and we really, we, we do many things, uh, but one of them is working one-on-one -on -one with students. And we work with students to create a curriculum that matches their needs and their learning profile. Uh, we do work with many students who have learning challenges and learning exceptionalities. Um, and we work with kids who have all types of needs from giftedness through to executive functioning, ADHD uh, challenges, as well as reading and, and writing challenges too. So, Let's take a look at where we're going to go this evening. Okay, it's an unusual time, it certainly is. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that we're getting to the end of it. And, uh, but it's been two years of, as we know, some really turbulent times, uh, some challenging times, stressful times. We know from Stats Canada that our 18 to 24 year olds have actually had the greatest impact on their mental health during COVID lockdowns, online school, in-person school, hybrid school, uh, and it's been a lot. And for those kids who are graduating, they're graduating, you know, they've had the, the last two, almost three years of school be very inconsistent and not what we would have expected for them. Let's move on. We're in a transition period here. So we want for our kids a smooth transition. And my feeling is that in order to have a smooth transition, we have to be prepared. And there are many ways to be prepared and there are many fronts on which we have to be prepared. So we're talking about academic preparation. You know, they've been working on their grades and doing their exams and getting their, um, you know, um, admissions letters all together, all of those pieces. But there's also an emotional preparation. And that goes both for the parents and the children that are moving on, or as, as I like to call them, our emerging adults. So we're going to talk a little bit about both the academic side and the emotional side this evening, because I think both are important to prepare for that smooth transition. And that idea of the gradual release of responsibility. I talk about that a lot. Uh, we practice that in our, in our lessons at Ruth Rumax Learning Space, where we will teach a concept, we will model that concept, we will, we will support the student in learning that concept, and then we will gradually re release the responsibility back to them to take ownership of that learning when they're ready. And I think as parents, we have to initiate that as well. And right now, January going into, um, you know, we've got six, seven, eight months before they are off on their own to some degree, we want to start putting some of those pieces in place right now. I love this, the, um, the little thing from the internet. We ask 18 year olds to make huge decisions about their career and financial future. When a month ago, they had to go to the bat, asked to go to the bathroom. It it's, rings true for me. So that's where we talk about that gradual release of responsibility and feeling confident as a parent that your kids got this. And even if they don't have it all, that's okay because you're still gonna be there to support them. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about academic skills first. Strategies for success. So at Ruth Rumax Learning Space, we have um, a whole host of things that we do to prepare our students. So we're gonna take a look at the next slide. And that's like the tip of the iceberg of what we work on with our students. And when we are working with students to prepare them for that university transition, we are looking at all sorts of aspects of their organizational methods, um, learning how to read for meaning as well as 
to put all of the pieces together for research, note taking, looking at their habits, trying to give them better habits, um, all of these pieces. And we do have a university readiness course that we have prepared that we would teach both one on one and in small groups. We're going to talk about that later. But this is just, as I said, the tip of the iceberg of what we touch on when we're working with our students. Now, of course, that's a whole load of stuff for a parent to, to be doing with a, a child over the next few months. But I'm gonna tell you some of the key things, the key areas that I think are gonna be useful for you as a parent to, to talk about, to chat about, to have a conversation with your kids, to figure out if they're ready, if they have these skills, or if they perhaps need to work on these skills a little bit over the next few months. Let's take a look. So the first thing on the list that I think is super, super duper important is the ability to decode the syllabi or the course outline. Uh, professors will always give you a course outline. Some of them are 25 pages long in a package. Some of them are two pages long as an overview. And it's really important for that student to sit down with that syllabus and really read it over. And when we work with students, with our university students, we're teaching them how to uh, take the information that they find and then put it somewhere useful. So whether that will become a calendar, a digital calendar, or a paper calendar, or both, um, we're looking at how do you plan for the next week or two weeks versus how do you plan for the month versus how do you plan for the whole semester? And there may be some of you right now that feel, oh my gosh, I don't know that my kid can do that. That's okay, because they can still learn these skills. They've got time to learn the skills. And hopefully when they get to that dorm room or to that first class, they're going to have an, an understanding of what to look for to be aware of so that they can take the notes they need to take um, to be on, on task and organized overall. So some of the things that we talk about when we're looking at um, the syllabi would be color coding and color coding for different courses. So whether again, whether we have a student who's using a digital uh, organizer or a paper organizer or both, I like to, to advocate for both. I like to have a paper organizer so that a student can sort of flip and see what's coming up ahead of time, cross things off. I'm, I'm a very hands-on kind of person. Um, a lot of our kids much prefer to do it on a, a Google calendar or some other type of digital calendar. Having a big calendar in the bedroom or the study area where you can see the whole month is really important. And most universities will either give these calendars out for Frosh Week or Initiation Week, um, or you can buy them at the bookstore too. So it's kind of nice to have that as a uh, a beforehand thing so that you're prepared. Now, let's take a look at the next slide because the next slide shows us an example of two different things. The first two pages uh, are very detailed course information. And this, the third page is a schedule of sessions. Every course, as I said, is going to have some form of this. And your child's going to get three, four, five, six of them, depending on how many courses they're taking in a semester. And it's very important for them to sit down and actually read it through. Because if they read it through, and sometimes they need help to read it through, because there's so much information, and often you're going to get overwhelmed with that amount of information. But a student needs to know, who do I go to for help? You're going to see in that um, syllabus or the course outline, the name of the professor, what the professor's hours are, what the who the TA is, perhaps, or who to reach out to if you have questions. You're also going to see usually important dates. And that's key because those are the things that are going to go on the calendar that your child has to put on ahead of time so that they know what they're working towards. Okay, let's look at the next one. The next big area is organization and prioritizing. And I think this is tricky for some students to understand what is the priority and what is not the priority. Most people, adults included, we like to do the things that are easy or that we feel we know how to do first. And we leave the things that are uh, more challenging or things that we don't quite understand how to do or we don't know where to get started for last. But we encourage our students to flip that, to kind of go against their own logic of doing the easy thing first and trying to attack the thing or, or at least understand where to begin with the thing that is challenging for them. So that includes looking at that big assignment 
and breaking it down into smaller pieces, how to assess priorities. And uh, one of our best tools is the priority matrix. We're gonna show you that next. Okay, here's our priority matrix. And we have on the, we call that the, the Y axis, the up and down column, we have important versus not important. And across the top, we have urgent versus not urgent. However, there are some things that kind of meet up in the middle. So the important and urgent column would be things that you have to do right now. They are very time sensitive. That would be handing in an assignment, um, being prepared for a test, being present at a particular event. Those are things that are time sensitive that you can't get around. They have to be done right now. Do that first. The important things that are not urgent are things that may have a later due date. Maybe you've got an essay coming up. Maybe you have um, a, a presentation that you have to prepare for. Those are things that are happening in the future, but you know that they will be due soon. And so you want to do those next. Then on the bottom, we've got the not important and urgent column, which is some things that you can do later or not at all. So what would an example of something that's not important, but still urgent? Perhaps it's something that's time sensitive, um, but you don't necessarily have to do it right this moment. For example, booking a flight or booking an appointment for something. That's something that's time sensitive, getting back to somebody in a timely manner might be something that's urgent, but the topic itself isn't that important. So we have to teach the difference between important urgent and not important urgent. Both are time sensitive, but one can wait. And then we have the bottom column, which is the bottom corner that's not important and it's not urgent and it's really the fun stuff. Now, I happen to feel that we shouldn't always push the fun stuff aside. I think if we're all work and no play, we're gonna get really stressed out. So we have to find time to build in some of these not important, not urgent things but of course, not at the expense of the top row, the, the important, urgent, or important, not so urgent things. So one thing that I want to keep in mind is that students should be, and we should be encouraging our kids to schedule time for both physical exercise, socializing, as well as some type of mental um, stress release, either yoga or meditation or something that eases their mental stress as well. And those are things that may not go in that bottom pile. They, they may not be not urgent and not important. I know for my husband, for, for a fact, that if he doesn't work out on a regular basis, his mind gets really clouded and he gets really grumpy. So I'm encouraging him to go out for his run or to go out for his walk or whatever he needs to do just to clear his head, because in fact, it makes him more productive and happier and of course, easier to live with. So we don't wanna sweep those things aside, Self-care is really important. We're going to talk about that a little later as well. Okay, let's move on. So some other methods of time management that uh, we're just going to touch on here. Keep in mind that I'm only sharing some, a few little tips and tricks at a time because, of course, if I wanted to share everything, it would take me hours and hours and hours. Um, but we do need a method of time management. And time management isn't just using a calendar for due dates. It's actually the technique of taking an assignment and breaking it into smaller pieces and figuring out when you're going to do each piece. And in high school, you know, as you get into grade 11 and grade 12, you do get longer culminating projects. So students have had experience with taking a bigger project and breaking it down into smaller pieces, but they may have had some support with that. And here's the first opportunity that they're going to have to do that themselves. They're going to have to take this 10 page essay that's going to be due in three weeks from now and figure out when do I do the research? At what point do I stop doing the research and I start writing my outline? From the outline, how much time do I have before I have to get my good copy in? They have to come up with those timelines themselves. And of course, there is still support around. So a couple of tools that we like to use. Um, on the right of your screen, you can see sort of the old school method with color-coded sticky notes. And I love the idea of color-coded sticky notes. The problem is that they often fall off the page and then I get all mixed up and I don't know where something was supposed to go. So another uh, opportunity or something that's an alternative to that is a digital task like Trello. 
Trello is an organizational tool. You can color code the different subjects. You can um, put different uh, parts of the, the, the assignment under different headings. Um, and you've got all sorts of different tools that you can use to help you keep yourself organized, including reminders, including setting important dates and having an alarm go off. Um, so there are many different ways to use the idea of color coding and sticky notes, but in a digital form. So Trello is one of them. There are many others out there, but that's the one that, that we like to use at, at, uh, at the office too. Let's take a look at the next one. Okay. Another method of time management, something that I find students really struggle with is how long do I stay focused on something? Some students can stay focused for a very long time. They'll hyper focus. They'll stay with something for two or three hours. And then they're kind of, you know, sometimes discombobulated at the end of it and they've overdone it and then they're exhausted for the rest of the day. So there's something called the Pomodoro technique. Pomodoro as in the uh, tomato and it's called the Pomodoro techniques because it came out of Italy. And it's a way of chunking a task into smaller pieces. So you don't exhaust yourself, you keep yourself mentally focused and you do take regular breaks. And it works like this. It can be used in a 25 minute chunk or a 50 minute chunk. And a 25 minute chunk would look like 25 minutes of work, you set your timer, you choose the task that you're going to do for that 25 minutes. And then at the end of 25 minutes, the timer goes off, you take a five minute break, then you come back and you do another 25 minutes. And you can do a series of three or four of these that can lead up to two hours of studying or work, but you're taking regular breaks. And when we talk about breaks, of course, we wanna do something physical, get outside, get some fresh air, go bounce a basketball, run up and down the stairs, um, do something for your brain. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. But this idea of instead of powering through and sitting for two to three hours at a time, do shorter spurts uh, and you actually end up being able to sustain your energy longer and you're more productive over time. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Here are some uh, ideas for breaks. So, you know, so many parents say to me, uh, when my kid takes a break, all they want to do is go play video games because it just, you know, they sort of, their brain gets numbed out and then they feel a little bit better. My hesitation with recommending something like that is that the brain does get numbed out and it doesn't actually help to keep you focused and keep you moving forward. So if we're going to take a break, I would suge suggest either a physical break, an active break, um, a snack break that has some good protein in it, some good food, and a type of brain break. If you want to get away from the reading or the research, do something else that activates a different part of your brain, like a Sudoku puzzle or a crossword or something that keeps you engaged, but doesn't let the, the brain chemicals kind of fade into the distance. All right, let's take a look at the next part. So here's another big one that I get from parents a lot, which is my kid is always being uh, derailed by social media, by you know scrolling through Instagram or Facebook or um, you know being online at, and doing things that are time wasters, but not actually getting the productive time into the work. So a couple of apps, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but one of them is um, called Forest and the other one is called Stay Focused. And this is one way that if they are going to be on their computer uh, or their devices, they are able to block certain websites from their screen. And the forest one starts by giving you a counter or a time, a, a timed piece of time, timed piece of time, chunk of time where it blocks you from certain, um, certain websites. The, and then if when you reach your goal and you've stayed away from those websites for that certain amount of time, there's a timer at times, times down, then you get a tree, you can plant it in your virtual forest, and it kind of motivates you to, to stay on track for that period of time, however long you've, you've um, scheduled it. So that's scheduled right now for 25 minutes, which is exactly the same time uh, as the Pomodoro method. So if you're doing 25 minute sections, you block out these other websites, and you keep working until the timer goes off. 
The other one, say, Stay Focused, works the opposite way where you block the time-wasting websites. Um, you only allow yourself to be on them for a certain amount of time. And once you've re reached that limit, then you don't have access to those again for the day. So let's say you say, I, I'm gonna give myself an hour a day to be on Facebook. Um, that's it. And once that hour is gone, cumul cumulatively, then you're not allowed on Facebook anymore. Of course, all of these things still take the discipline of the person not to reprogram them and not to ignore them or go on a different device. But it does help to keep people focused a little longer. Uh, the big thing that I would say to keep the, your distractions at bay is to put your devices out of sight. Put them in a drawer, hide them, put them under the bed, something where you're not actually physically able to touch them or go to them. Another good suggestion would be to use a separate computer or a separate device for uh, leisure versus school or work so that you actually have two separate computers or two um, uh, profiles that you keep uh, one for each so that you're not kind of bouncing between the two and tempted to go on to your email or your Facebook, et cetera. All right, let's look at the next one. So note taking, another really, really important aspect to a student's success. And I think this is one of the big issues that students face when they make that transition from high school to university or college, because they're just not used to the volume of lecture material that is coming at them at one time. And they haven't had a lot of practice in taking notes while the teacher is talking for long periods of time. So one of the suggestions that we make is to use a template. And uh, there are many different note-taking templates. We teach how to use the Cornell note-taking method. There are several out there, but many universities also recommend the Cornell note-taking method. And you can see from the template that it's really clear. You've got you know, the name of the, um, either of the subject or the course, you've got the topic, the date, and then you have a little box for the main ideas that you you hear or you are reading. This can be used both for lecture notes and for research notes. You put your notes in that main section and then you summarize. And that summary can be done at the end of a class or during a study period. Um, or if the teacher is sort of giving you that wrap up, the professor, that's when you take those notes and you put them in the summary. So something like this, when you get used to using it, becomes very quick and it becomes very easy to kind of look at that summary at the bottom uh, for each page of notes or, or each lecture to be able to have an overview of what actually happened there in the, in the lecture. Um, I see that something has popped up on the chat. Let's see. Oh, maybe not. Oh, wait, hold on. Give me a second. Um, Okay, Caitlin has a really good question. What if the child has challenges processing information while taking notes so she can't multitask? Excellent question. Thank you so much for bringing that up. So there are, we are gonna talk a little bit about accommodations at the university level as well. So I'm gonna save a little bit of the information for that. Um, but there are many ways that a student can take notes in a lecture these days. And um, the other part of it is to teach how to, it's very, okay, let me backtrack. For some students who have processing challenges, it's very difficult, difficult to listen and to process the information and to write at the same time. So in order to do that effectively, we have to use some strategies and tools. And instead of jumping ahead, Caitlin, I am gonna address this. I'm gonna come back to it in a couple of minutes when we get to that section, um, but hang on, so hang on. I wanna mention also that handwriting, so writing by hand in cursive, actually helps our brains remember things better. And there have been many MRI studies that show how the brain processes information and how the uh, memory parts of the brain are activated when you are handwriting or cursive writing something versus when you are printing it versus when you are typing it. And we've seen through the MRI studies that the greatest brain activity comes when you are actually doing cursive writing or connected writing. Now, challenging when most kids haven't learned how to cursive write, but there is still something to be said for our memories and the ability to hand write it uh, and put the notes down on paper, even if it's just a few words, key words that a child or a student is going to remember. Okay, we've got another chat question. 
What about students who are used to taking notes on their computer? Does the Cornell method work for them? Yes, absolutely. Um, it does because you can use a template and, uh, and a program that allows you to type into that template or to write on the template. Or they take bullet notes or just jot notes. And then at the end of the class or during their study or review period, they would go back and take those notes and put them into a Cornell template, again, as part of their study or review sessions, which are important. Um, you know, there's a, a ratio out there that says that for every one hour of uh, class, you should be putting in three to four hours of studying. So if you have a three hour class per week, you have three hours of that class, you want to be putting in nine to 12 hours of studying, preparing, doing the work um, to be ready and successful in that class. Do students do that? Mm, not always, but I would say as they learn what is expected of them and they see how quickly the class moves, more students are inclined to um, become open to putting that extra time in outside of just being in the classroom. Uh, Jolene asks if the this will be sent out afterwards and yes, it will be. So we do have a recording and you will be giving getting handouts and suggestions and links and all sorts of goodies as well. Okay, um, let's go back to the where we're at. All right, let's see here. Let's move on to the next page for now. Okay. So here is a suggestion for Caitlin and her, her daughter. Uh, this is called the, there's a lot of technology based accommodation or, or um, help that you can get, support that you can get. And typing is one of them. So if, if your child has, uh, is easier, it's easier for them to type, by all means, they're gonna be using the computer. Our grade 12 students are so used to using computers um, that it's almost an extension of their own fingers. So another way to take notes in a class that doesn't have that, you know, that's overwhelming because it's hard to listen and process at the same time is to audio record the lecture. Now, some uh, professors may not want audio recordings of their lectures. You'll have to check with each professor individually. But if you do have um, the, the capability or the, the permission to audio record, you can take something called Otter, which is a transcription app, and you can transfer that audio recording into the app. And then that app will actually transcribe the notes for you with quite a high degree of accuracy. I use Otter myself when I wanna do a voice recording. Um, and then there's something called the Live Scribe Pen, which is so incredible, I love it. It's a pen, looks like a pen. It has a microphone on the top. It has a proper ballpoint pen on the bottom. And it has a little camera on the, around the tip. And you use special paper that has, it's like a dot matrix. And what that pen will do is record the sound so you can get the live recording. That live recording can then be downloaded and transcribed through their, um, their software or their app. And then you can have the video recording. It's, it's, it's basically um, measuring out where you are on the paper at a particular timestamp on the recording. So a child who or an individual who has difficulty processing or just wants to listen instead of taking notes, all they need to do is write down a number or a symbol or a few words that will tell the pen at this point, I want to go back and listen to what was said. So let's say uh, the professor is talking about an upcoming exam and she's giving clues on the exam. So a person might write exam clues and then number one. And then what happens is when you go to that recording and you touch the paper on with the pen on that particular place on your page, it will jump right to that place where the recording was made and that symbol match up. So it's easier to, to demonstrate, but for, for individuals who just wanna listen uh, or have trouble handwriting or who have trouble note-taking, this is an, a really incredible um, invention. So that's the live scribe pen. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. I'm gonna pause for a moment and uh, I would love to field questions or comments if there's anything that you want more information on. So let me know if you've got questions about the academic side of things um, or some concerns that you're 
you're having for your kids or that your kids might be having for themselves that they've expressed. I'm open for questions. Anybody have some questions? Dun, dun, dun. Okay, we are going to, oh, here's one. Lynn says, my daughter takes extensive notes in full words. Uh, do you suggest a shorthand? Yes, I do. I do because there's a lot of information that's gonna come at her. Most people will kind of work out their own shorthand uh, after a while. So it's something that you can, um, you know, she can sort of start practicing right now. Some people like the full notes and they're fast at it. So, you know, I don't wanna mess her up and start to say, no, 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 now you should be doing it in a different way. If it works for her, that's fine. She may find though, that when she has many, many courses, it's going to become taxing and tiring for her, in which case a shorthand will help. Um, she could too, there are typical shorthands or, or programs on shorthand, or like I said, she can make up her own uh, with particular words that she uses often. So shorthand is good. It saves time and it saves energy and mental energy as well. Um, Irene says, I was wondering if there are any courses to teach high school students to write in cursive. Well, that's interesting. Uh, we do teach cursive and we love to teach cursive um, and we use uh, various methods. Uh, one of them is the handwriting without tears method. And it's something that the, it's the connected letters. It's not that they have to be perfect and all the same size necessarily, although that does help with legibility, but it's the idea of connecting the letters that actually allows you to write faster and make that brain brain based connection. Caitlin says, are there any tools uh, or courses on how to take effective notes when researching for a paper? Yes. Um, and all of all of these things that I'm mentioning are things that we do teach and we teach through our university re readiness course, whether you take it one on one or you take it as a small group. I know that we are going to be running it over the summer um, and our schedule will be coming out in the next few weeks. So if you check back in with our website, we're going to put the um, the link into the chat right now, um, but you'll definitely have opportunities to talk to us further about those courses. and. Note taking, like, as I said, I could be here talking to you all evening about just note taking techniques. And for somebody who has a particular learning challenge or processing challenge, you really want to get to know that student and figure out what works best for them. In any case, universally, you want to get to know what works best for that particular student. So having the opportunity to get to know a student before making recommendations is always helpful. Um, but there are many different techniques out there and many different types of templates and many different assistive technologies that could be helpful. I'm actually going to ask Joelle um, from Ruth Max Learning Space to put in the chat, maybe the link to our assistive technology webinar, which we have recorded on our YouTube channel. So if you have particular questions about assistive technology, I would watch that webinar um, to get a, a general overview. And then always, you can always reach us for further questions. Okay, let's take a look. Oh, I've got one new message. Let's see. Oh, that was it. Joelle did it. Thank you, Joelle. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk about mental health, health, mental wellness. Let's see, Joelle starting her screen again. There we are. So let's talk first a little bit about the changing role of parents and how, how I asked you at the beginning, how are you guys feeling? How are you feeling? You're nervous, you're a little stressed, you're excited, you're happy for your kids to be moving on, but it's still stressful. And it's often stressful, you know, you watch your, your child in, at the beginning of grade 12, middle of grade 12, you know that this imminent transition is coming up, you're concerned as to whether they're ready for it, do they have all those skills, can they be independent, can they do this on their own. And as I said at the beginning, not entirely, you know, we, we are not islands, we don't operate on our own all the time, we need a support system. And our parents should still be our support system, but in a different way. So how do we wanna do that? This gradual release of responsibility is really important. And it's something that you can start to implement now if you haven't already. Little things like if your child has uh, to make a dentist appointment or needs a dentist appointment, instead of making it for them, give them the dentist number and say, here you go, uh, Ellie, it's time for you to make your dentist appointment. And 
If they need a little bit of help on what to say or how to say it or how to schedule it, you're there, you can model for them, but giving them that opportunity to take control of their own schedule and their own personal needs is a step in the right direction because they're gonna need it, right? Um, you want them to be able to take advantage of all the things that are on campus, including the wellness centers and, uh, you know, checking in with counselors if they need it, and you want them to be able to have confidence to reach out and schedule those things for themselves. It also comes in handy as a precursor to being able to reach out to a professor or a teaching assistant to say, hey, I have a question about this particular thing. You know, can I come and see you during office hours? A lot of students will resist that. They feel that the professor or the TA is like so far removed from them. And truthfully, when you're in a lecture of 500 students, it does feel like they're very far removed, but they are still available to that student. And I always encourage our students to be brave and to make a connection with the professor, introduce themselves during a professor's office hours, just so that they know who they are. Because as they go on through their years of university or post-secondary, they're gonna want to have uh, a good relationships with professors, perhaps they want to get into graduate school and they need a letter of recommendation. They, it's nice to have somebody know who you are and you're not just a nameless face in a crowd. So part of giving your student new responsibilities and watching them take them on and, and excel with them is allowing them to get prepared for things that they are going to have to do on their own in the future. The next point I have here is developing these new parameters with your emerging adult. And, you know, my, I have got two kids. My, my son is 29 and my daughter is 12. So I've been through many, many, many different things at many different points over many years. And, you know, as my son was going through university and he'll admit it took him a long time, took him seven years to get that, that, uh, or maybe not seven, took him five years, five years to get that first degree. And uh, there were some stops and starts and there were some moments where it was like, ah, I don't know if he's gonna finish, but he did. And over the, the years from first year through to the year that he graduated, you know, we, we had to kind of support him in different ways at different times. And part of that was watching him become a, an emerging adult, a young adult, and having those conversations of, well, what do you want? You know, this is, this is your future and your life. How can I support you in getting to your goals? Um, you know, what do you want from me? What do you need from me? So asking questions that are different than telling your child what they need to do next, but giving them the tools and the language and the vocabulary to be reflective for themselves and also figuring out what they need to do for themselves next. Um, go for coffee, you know, go for tea, go for a walk, not when it's minus 25 degrees outside, but go for a walk and have a, a relaxed conversation. Different than kind of being in the moment of, um, you know, the bedroom's a mess and you haven't done your chores and you still have an assignment to do. Take yourself out of that for a half hour and just go for a walk with your kids or a drive and have that open conversation with them. The idea of supporting without judgment is really, really important because we want our kids to be able to come to us when they need it. They are gonna push back. They're not gonna want to, to rely on our support as parents, but I think in a crunch situation where it's really important that they are open and that they share with us, we want them to feel that they can. And so trying to take the judgment of, um, you know, I think you should be doing this even though you think you should be doing that, is helpful. And again, that comes through perhaps conversation that is more questioning and more open ended, rather than telling somebody what to do particularly. Okay, let's look at the next one. How will I know if my child is struggling? I think parents um, are worried about this because sometimes we're sending our kids away and we won't see them every day. We may still chat with them, text them, talk to them on the phone or FaceTime them, but we won't be there with them. And we're afraid that we won't be able to see signs of things going south. Uh, we won't be able to be there to help them when they need it most. So this is, this is you know, realistic 
uh, to look for these signs and to make sure that your student is coping well, because not everybody does cope well in those first couple of months. So some signs of, of depression or anxiety might include withdrawing or pulling away, uh, which is also kind of natural when you're going off into first year university that you want some autonomy and you want some alone time and you want to be able to do your own thing because that's what university is all about. But, you know, again, there's a there's a um, there's a fine line between being really um, taking that that too far and being very exclusionary versus, you know, just that normal, natural tendency to to want to have some independence. Um, you want to look for things like a loss of interest in things that they previously enjoyed. So if they were really into sports and now they're not doing any sports, if they, um, you know, really enjoyed a particular activity and, and now they're not doing it at all. Um, conversations about hopelessness or really negative outlooks. I mean, there is going to be, there are going to be moments where a child is, is panicking and not sure that they can handle the work potentially, um, or something is due in the next three days and they haven't started yet. Yes, you're going to get potentially some panicked calls, but we wanna look for a pattern and is it happening with every subject or is it just one subject or one assignment in particular? Definitely wanna look for things like extreme changes in appetite or sleeping patterns, fatigue, that type of thing. Um, and we wanna look at the emotional levels. We wanna look at extreme emotions of really, really highs and really, really lows, um, not being able to complete assignments on time or that idea of, of giving up. You know, Feeling overwhelmed is going to be natural, but it's how you deal with it and giving your child some techniques to deal with it or pointing them in the right direction of, of who can they go to to help them deal with it is really important. So let's look at the next slide. Um, here are some things that we can do as parents as we're having these conversations. Definitely validate those feelings. Um, yeah, you know what? It is really natural to feel overwhelmed. It's natural to feel sad and to miss home. It's natural to feel like you have made a mistake, that you don't belong there. Those are natural feelings that come up. Um, but it's, ta it's about talking about them and realizing that most people have these feelings. That's okay. It's what we do about it next that is crucial normalizing that struggle um you know everybody not everybody but many people around you are going through it maybe you talk about your own experiences uh you know making that transition to post-secondary or leaving home or a big transition in your life where you were also feeling those things keep that open dialogue keep talking uh you know again if it's not um if it can be kind of removed from the day-to-day -day grind and you have a special time that you talk once a week or you share a cup of coffee or tea over FaceTime, but something that just keeps you engaged with your kids in a way that is, uh, as we said before, not judgmental. And here's the big one, which is helping your emerging adult solve the problem without doing it for them. And this is where I was saying, laying the foundation this year or earlier where you are not doing all the appointments or making all the, the decisions for them, but you're allowing them to do some on their own will help them have confidence to be able to do it in the future. But knowing for yourself, the resources that are available on campus is really important. So every campus has a wellness center. Every campus has a student uh, success center or a student center where you can go to get psychology services, um, there, are, uh, there are doctor services, dentist services, there are all sorts of things on campus. And those centers provide all types of courses for free, drop-ins, yoga, meditation, all different things that they can access uh, to help with their mental health and their mental well-being. And you want to direct them to that place, even give them the number, or when you're doing your tour of the university or the college, to make sure that, that those things are pointed out so that your child knows where to go if they need help and you can't be there for them at that moment. All right, let's look at the next one. So what can we do to encourage a successful transition? Uh, I think, as I was saying before, be familiar with the resources that are available on campus, uh, both online and virtually, because we're still gonna be able to access a lot of virtual things, even if our kids are going back in person. Go to the orientations, make sure that your kids go to the orientations, 
and as I mentioned, the wellness centers, and join clubs, get involved. There are a lot of studies that look at the success of students as related to how involved they are in their school or in their dorm or their community, their, their learning community. So there are so many, like hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of clubs at, at a post-secondary institution, um, everything from a Dungeons and Dragons club to a kayaking club to sports teams and all sorts of other things, chess clubs, like you name it, they've got it. And it's really great to encourage your student to go to make new friends. They may be going to school with people that they know. Um, they may be going with nobody that they know. And having an opportunity to meet people outside of their program uh, or outside of their dorm, along with the people that they're going to see on a regular basis is really important. And then, of course, as we said before, to promote that self-care. So physical exercise, good sleep, relaxation, um, and, and of course, blowing off steam and having some fun too. That's another presentation. Let's look at the next thing. Um, I think this is really important. And I put this on here because as we know, you know, sometimes kids will struggle and they don't feel comfortable coming to us to talk about things. Here is the number, the good to talk number. This is specifically for post-secondary students as a helpline. And, uh, you know, put it on a sticky note stick it stick it on their bag somehow give it to your child to know that there is somewhere they can turn to anonymously to have some questions answered or for some other support um, and this is an idea of having a struggle plan again i'm not suggesting that everybody's going to struggle everybody's going to become overwhelmed but there may be moments and it's nice to have a conversation with your kid ahead of time to as i said give them the tools to be able to get themselves out of it or to at least ask for the right support um, when they need it. All right, let's take a look. Here we go. This is, this is very important for individuals with learning exceptionality. So strategies for success. Let's take a look at what we've got. Again, you know, the, pre the, the preparation is the most important thing for a smooth transition. And for a child, a student who has exceptionalities, that preparation is often uh, has to be done even further in advance. And we want to leave a long lead time to make sure that we've got all the pieces in place so that that child has all of the right things that they need to be successful when they get to school in September. So if you do have a, a child with a, um, an IEP, an individual education plan, that they have accommodations at the school level, that is something that can be transferred into the university setting. The university will usually require a psychoed, a psychoeducational evaluation that is two years fresh, which means that if they're going into um, university at age 17, that has to be done at age 15 or 16 or 17. Now, the thing that I want to recommend is that let's say you had your child psychoed done early on, maybe in grade five, six, or seven. Um, it's not going to be valid enough for the university to make those accommodations. But if you are planning on redoing the psychoed, you want to wait until they are at least 16 because the, the 16 and above age range is considered an adult psychoed, which is different than the pre-16. And uh, universities usually won't look at that pre-16 one. So if you're kind of on the fence and your kid is 15, wait if you can to the 16 age range so that they can use it for university in the future. Um, the accessibilities or success services, or I mean, each one has different a different name. They have so many resources, like so many more resources at university are available to students with challenges or disabilities than uh, than at the high school level. Things like a note taker, so somebody can go to class with your child and take notes for that child themselves, and then your child gets the copy of those notes. Um, they are volunteers, they're usually students themselves, and or they're already in that class, and they share their notes with somebody else, or you have a dedicated note taker that goes with your child from class to class, if a psychoed proves that they cannot do the note taking and the listening at the same time. Um, there are many other reasons why you would need a note taker, either, you know, an auditory uh, disability or a visual disability or um, uh, processing or graphomotor. There are many, many reasons why you would need a note taker. Um, 
Then we have things like time and a half on exams. You might have to have your uh, exam read orally to you or use a device that would help you take the exam and, and prepare your answers. There are many, many things that are available to a student. But again, having the conversation with the accessibility office early will allow you to kind of look at the menu of things that might apply and have an officer or an advisor there to help you figure out what's going to be best for your student. Now, I have to say, and I should have said this at the beginning, in talking to many admissions officers and many um, accessibility officers at the universities, they will, tell, they will all tell you the same thing, that your child, who is your child and your, your pride and joy, is the student, is the client, let's say, of the university. You, as the parent, are not. And so anything that is going to be asked for has to be asked for through the student. A parent cannot come and make those demands of an accessibility office um, without, of course, the permission or without the, um, the student being there to support it. So I've talked to many university professors who have said, you know, I, I get calls from parents all the time. Uh, they want to know how their students doing and, and, you know, what they can do to help. But I have to remind them that, that it's the child, it's the student that has to make that initiation of information. It's not the parent. They are not, they are not able to release the information to a parent. So I know we, as loving parents, want to do everything we can for our kids. And so, of course, the best thing that we can do is help them to advocate for themselves and to figure out how to ask for what they need. And if they're not used to doing that yet, it's January. We still got a bunch of months. Include them in their IEP meetings. Include them in their, um, you know, in a, in a link less, a list of their strengths and weaknesses and make sure that they are able to voice their um, their concerns and what they feel they need to succeed most. All right, let's take a look at the next slide. This is a really great um, uh, website, Transition Resources Guide. It goes through every single university in um, Canada, and it gives us the uh, all of the different information that you need for students with disabilities or exceptionalities. So if you have particular questions about a particular university, use this guide and it's gonna help you get the information a lot faster than you know, phoning around and figuring it out yourself. All right, what's the next one? Oh, oh my goodness, so I think we've come to the end of my slides. I'm going to turn off the slides for a second and uh, I'm gonna open it up for questions and I would love to hear your comments. Tell me, um, let's, let's see what we've got. Any, any questions so far? More, ah, we've got one from Sue. Uh, have ADHD, learning disability diagnosed pre-16 and autism, OCD diagnosed post-16. Do we need to redo ADHD learning disability or will she be in the system and we can provide the info? Let me read that again. Um, diagnosed pre-16 and the other one was post-16. Ah, so that's a good question. You would probably get a number of accommodations just based on the post-16 diagnosis um, that would probably work for both. But again, I would check with the particular universities that you're looking at going to um, and ask their ask them directly because again, every accessibility office has a little bit of a different different approach to it, but definitely you would be able to get some accommodations based on whatever diagnosis was coming out of that post 16 year old um, uh, uh, psychoed or evaluation, whatever that was. So you will probably get a lot, um, but just to make sure you wanna check with them first. I hope that answers the question. Also remembering that uh, anything that is in their IEP now will transfer with them, but the university still needs that documentation, the psychoed documentation to implement it long term. So what some students will have will have happen is they will have some of their accommodations in place temporarily um, in that first year of university until they can get the second the, the psychoed done at that post 16 year old um, level. 
So you won't be going in with nothing, but you won't maybe get everything until you have a recent psychoed. All right, any other questions? How to get an IEP for university? Okay, good question. Really, you would um, work with, you can work with your current school to make sure that your IEP is up to date and that everything that you could possibly want on that IEP is listed now because the universities will look at the, the most recent IEP version from the high school. And then again, you wanna call up that accessibilities office and make an appointment, make it now. If you know where your child is going to go or you know, you know you've got a choice of a few places, make that um, call now so that you can get a time to, make, to meet with that advisor and that advisor will take you through their steps particularly. Uh, Lynn says, where do you suggest getting the analysis done? Oh, okay, that's good. Um, well, psychologists and there are many psychology clinics that offer psychoeds um, and I would say if you do want a particular list from, from my list, you can go on our website and we have a whole list of resources. Joelle, maybe you can put that in there. Also, you can put the link in the chat. Um, and we want to, you know, again, we'll help you out in any way that we can if you want some more suggestions. Um, but any, most psychology clinics and many individual psychologists will perform these psychoeducational evaluations. And many of them, if you do have health coverage, they're expensive, uh, you know, they're between $2,500 and $3,500, but most health coverage will cover the cost of the psychoed, or at least part of it, 80%. Uh, Erica says, when does your group summer course for students start? Oh, thank you. Good question. We are having, we're just finalizing our, um, our dates right now. So probably in the next two weeks, you will get an email if you're on our email list. And if you're not on our email list, I suggest that you put your name on our email list so that um, we can let you know. We will have different sections of them. So it's usually a two-week course and it's quite intense and we'll do it several times throughout the summer. Summer courses start usually the first week of July. Yep. And John says, thanks very much, Ruth. This was excellent. The Pomodoro technique and the, re the reminder about self-care were my favorites. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else would like to share? I told you I would ask you at the end and John has reminded me. Uh, what did you take from today? What is your big takeaway or the thing that you want to implement and try at home? Um, I'm just going to go back to our questions. My son shows interest in managing his own tasks, but only the ones he has interest in. Yeah, of course. Uh, any advice how to convince him to also do things that he doesn't have to, for example, look for optional scholarships? Ah. So in those, in those cases, I think you want to try and encourage your student, and, and it might take a little bit of modeling, and you might have to do a little bit of little more handholding, which is, hey, you know what, I'm I'm going to put aside an hour today, this evening, on the weekend, let's book a time when you and I can sit down and look for some of these optional scholarships together. I wonder sometimes if, and in this case, if it's not a matter of not being so interested in it, but not knowing where to begin. And a lot of times we, as human beings, avoid the things that we don't know where to start. We don't know how to, to, to like take that initial task. So perhaps if you sit down together and get started and you can show him, oh, well, this is where we're going to find the information um, and then let him go with it once you've got the ball rolling. Maybe that would be easier for him. Sue says, take away, many are in the same boat. Yes, 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 it's true. It's very true. Both the students are feeling the same things and the parents are feeling the same things. It's very normal. And I think if you talk about it, uh, you know, a little more, if you've got peers and family members that you can say, I'm really worried, then they can say, don't worry, your kid's going to be okay. Your kid is going to be okay. There will be ups and downs. There will be rough patches. There will be panicked phone calls and tears perhaps, but they will be okay. Uh, Lynn says, we got so involved in seeing her applying and getting accepted and forgot about the techniques for taking notes for the lectures and planning. Lots to think about and appreciate all your pointers. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And again, you know, if you do have a, a student who needs some extra support, give us a call because that's our expertise. That's what we do. And we still have, like I said, lots of months. We've got a good chunk of time to really target some of these organizational um, note taking 
or uh, time management techniques that we can apply to the high school level, the grade 12 level, so that she's practicing them and then she can start to apply them more independently come September. Uh, Irene says, are your classes online or in person? They are both. And uh, right now, Right now we're mostly virtual because we've had to shut down in Toronto. However, we have, uh, we do do some in person, but I know that we will be putting our, um, our university readiness course online so that kids can take it from wherever they are. Yes, at the cottage, uh, on a boat. I can tell you we've actually done lessons for students while they were traveling the world on a boat. It was a little challenging in some areas where they didn't have great Wi-Fi, but we did do it. Um, Karen says great suggestions. Thank you very much. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, I will stick around for a little bit longer. If there's something that pops up, I'd love to continue the chat. Um, I would like to say as a wrap up, it's, you know, it's a tough time. And it's a tough time, particularly because where we are in the pandemic also, and things have been so discombobulated and all over the place. But at the root of it, and this is talking from my experience, both as a teacher and as a parent who's watched a kid go into university, make his way through university, come out the other end, and then go on to, you know, post, um, post university studies. Maturity has a big piece to play. And knowing as a parent, when to open up your arms and say, do you need a hug? Like, I, I got I got you here. I'm, I'm here for you. What do you need to succeed? What can I do for you? And when to take the, um, you know, the grumbles and the eye rolling as a sign to just step back just a little bit and to play that line between I'm here for you always and but I know that you've got this and I'm not going to step in unless you really need me to. And then having those conversations on a regular basis with your kid to check in to see where they're where they're at at that moment. Uh, Lynn says, do you help existing students at university who have issues taking notes? Absolutely. Yes, we do see university students usually in the first and second years when they're just figuring out that they don't know how to take notes. Uh, sometimes they'll kind of go in guns a blazing and then middle of the term they'll realize, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't actually know how to do this. And then the panic sets in. So we kind of swoop in at that time and start to give them some techniques. But of course, it would be much better and much easier if we can get to those students before they start first year to give them those techniques and then keep working with them through first year to keep um, refining their strategies. Um, oh dear, so Lynn is saying that a student spends three hours per lecture but ends up with blisters and very sore fingers. Yeah, yeah, I think there are definitely things that we can, we can share with that student to help um, alleviate that pressure for sure. Uh, Caitlin says, thank you so much. How would we make arrangements to assess and what types of note-taking tools and research tools would work for an individual through his current learning strategist? He really doesn't take any. Okay, well, you know what, um, Caitlin, just stick around after the, uh, after the presentation and we'll have a little chat. So don't go away. Anybody else who wants private information, don't go away either. But of course, any of you can uh, access our information at ruthrumac.com triple w r u t h r u m as in michael a c k dot com uh, you can send in send us an email just saying you want information on x and our client services team is so amazing they're very fast to get back to people and we would then set up a time for one of our um, managers our learning specialist managers to take it do an intake call with you get all the information and then make a whole bunch of suggestions um, oh, and Joelle says you can also respond to her email that you'll receive after the webinar that has all the links and all of the um, all of the suggestions and, and uh, a link to the, the recording of this as well. Good one. Good one, Joelle. Thank you. All right. I am so glad that you stuck around. I really appreciate your time. And again, we are here for you for whatever questions you have. And I do hope that you join us for our next set of webinars. Um, always check back at our website. We've got webinars going all through the school year and on various topics that might appeal to you for the child you're talking about right now, or maybe a different child or somebody else that you know. Um, other than that, I wish you all a wonderful evening. And thank you again for being here. Take care. 
All right. Who's got questions? Let's see. Um, <laughs> Lynn says her notes are perfect and picture worthy and colored. You know what? Those are beautiful. I'm sure they're beautiful notes. And a perfectionist has the ability to make some really incredible um, pieces, pieces of long lasting information. But if it comes at the price of her, uh, you know, exhaustion or her ability to stay focused, we, we can help perhaps give her some pointers. Let's see who's around, who's stuck around. I see we've got lots of people left. Um, stick your questions in there. Let's hear your questions if you have particular questions or if you would like to come off of mute and ask me a question um, directly, we can do that too. So let's see, uh, anybody have a particular question? Don't be shy, I won't bite, I promise. I'm just waiting, I'm waiting. Like I said, if you wanna come off of mute, um, then let me know. Oh, Irene has a question. Oh, this is so cool. I can actually, let's see if I can do this. Oh, Irene, what can I do? Can you hear me, Irene? You can hear me, can I hear you? I think I'm unmuted now. There you are. Okay, hi, hi. how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Tell me. So the, the presentation was was very, very helpful, I found. So I've got a question about my son's handwriting. Yes. So he never learned how to write cursive. Yes. His handwriting is really bad, like self-admittedly. He, and he says, Mom, I don't think it's ever going to change. Mm. But I'm I'm concerned. Yeah. And I know I had spoken to somebody before and she had mes- mentioned that there's a diagnosis for dysgraphia. Yes. Does is that still something that, um, because I think I phoned a place that does psycho as at assessments and said that they don't diagnose for that anymore. So I'm kind of wondering how do I, yeah. That, I'd, that would seem strange to me because um, dysgraphia, there are a whole set of accommodations for dysgraphia. Um, so that seems a little bit odd. Um, does the is there any anything else like that is um any other diagnosis or any no. other learning challenge so it's just the no. dysgraphia. yeah so generally to have a dys- dysgraphia diagnosis you would have to go through an occupational therapist an ot oh okay and the ot can make the um oh there you go jolene is saying the same yes. thing. <laughs> same thing that i'm saying yeah so so you would go through an OT and the OT would give you the official diagnosis. Now, okay. I think if that's the case, how is he at typing? He's fine. He's fine. So, yeah. I mean, in our, in our digital age, what, where are the areas that you feel would be really challenging for him and handwriting that he wouldn't be able to use a computer? Yeah, I suppose he could, right? Like I'm thinking in a university lecture. Yeah. Well, in a university lecture, everybody uses their computers. Everybody. Okay. And so he, we don't have to worry about that. Yeah, he won't be any different. Um, and he's probably a pretty fast typer, right? Yeah. yeah. So chances are that, you know, when you look at like, uh, when you go into a lecture these days, you probably haven't been in one for a no. while. But <laughs> if you go a into a lecture, you'll see that it's it's like 90% laptops and everybody's okay. typing. Most okay. of the- Some kids are typing what's necessary. Some kids are playing video games. Some kids are on Facebook, but they do, um, that, that is a a typical classroom right now. Okay. Notes by, by typing. Right. The only thing that I could suggest, um, if you do, and he's willing, you know, I've worked with students before where we do, they have a diagnosis of dysgraphia and they come in and we will analyze their, their handwriting, either handwriting or printing. Mm Mm-hmm. And often we can just zero in on a few particular letters that right. they are that they are um, they're creating in an inefficient way that right. may be the hardest to read. And we can retrain them to do those particular letters in in a better way so that it's more right. efficient and more legible. So okay. if he's willing to, if yeah. you know, there there's a bit of self-esteem aspect about it too when you have very messy handwriting there's a little bit of shame involved sometimes because you you know it's always been highlighted um that you know my oh you know like my chicken scratch don't look at my thing or there some students are have it um 
sort of ingrained that they're there nobody else will be able to read their writing right. and so a little bit of embarrassment so if that's a factor and he's willing to work on it then we could do something about that right. in a short period of time right but if he doesn't feel that it's hampering him then it may not be right. worth pursuing right except for the diagnosis in which case he might be able to get accommodation so that he can always use a computer as opposed to um only when when it's allowed right because i'm thinking of an exam situation yeah. yeah exactly so so we have to have a little chat so would we get the referral to the occupational therapist from our family doctor is that I, how that works i think you can usually go directly to an occupation oh, okay okay yeah. that's you know what i will talk to him and i mean he, he just said to me tonight at dinner because i had looked at your website and i saw that you had the handwriting courses yeah and I said to him, you know, <laughs> I was looking at these, but they don't have any for high school students. No. And he, he said, he feels like this is it. It's never going to improve. And he said, you know, I'm just going to use humor to deal with it because, you know, if he's a well-rounded kid, he probably yeah. will get through it and that'll be fine. But I, I can tell you from experience that we have worked with people in the same situation, yeah. older students. I yeah. wouldn't do a group class. I would do no. some one-on-one -on -one no. <laughs> and you, you may not need months and months. You might just need a few particular sessions. Yeah. We retrain him and reteach him okay. particular letters and it can make a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. Just okay. even like five letters out of the alphabet. Okay. Well, because I, I know I, I've seen how he writes letters and I know that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but, you but know, having mom willing. try to teach you is, uh, <laughs> you know. Meh. No, that's Yeah, exactly. I've been yeah. trying since he was a kid. So, you know what? I'll have a conversation with him and we'll see. Yeah. So, yes, okay. again, give us a call. And on our website, we do have a list of resources for parents. Joelle, if you're listening, um, you can put that in to our resource list where we probably, I'm pretty sure that we have OTs listed there as well. Oh, um, but, you know, you, you can do a, I don't know, where are you? In We're in Mississauga. Okay. Mississauga. So, you know, yeah. you can do a Google search for- I'll find doctor. somebody. I, I may actually know somebody, like a personal friend. So I can always start with her, but yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Irene. Thank you. Thanks. All right, who's next? Who else wants to talk? Let's see, I'm going, oh, Caitlin. Hello, Caitlin. Hi, how are you? Oh, you can hear me and I can hear you. I'm great, how are you? I am well, thank you. Thank you so much. This was a really informative uh, seminar or webinar. Oh, so glad that you joined us. What can I so do for you? So our son works with Dan Gullery, who he loves very much as his learning yes. strategist. Yes. And uh, Padraig is uh, very bright, but has real challenges with things like note um, note taking so when he researches for a major essay like he did in the ib he had to write the extended essay yes. it was a nightmare yeah. because yeah. he read tons and tons of articles and books but to not to not take a single note meaning when he went to write yeah. he had to sift back through all of them and required a huge amount of assistance just to get it done yeah. so yeah. i'd love for him to have an individualized assessment in terms of what that that obviously won't work he wants to do humanities <laughs> <laughs> what, oh I, yeah. So I, I, I want him practice. Obviously, he can't go to university with a hypothetical tool he'll learn to use there. He needs to practice using a tool. So yeah. what's the best way to get some sort of individualized assessment to kind of work with him and figure out for him to figure out what would work for him and how he would use it? Is he still working with Dan right now? He is. Okay. So I think that that would be a good place to start. Um, and we, we, we should have a further conversation about it. So basically we wanna zero in on note taking strategies and figure out how to take notes more so you're thinking about research, take notes from, from doing research as opposed to lecture notes. Is that what you're saying? I think I, we're gonna play with some of the assistive te technologies to record lectures because I think yeah. that is the only thing that's gonna work for him and yeah. have no because he, he does have a diagnosis that he can't listen and take notes at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. In his yeah. Uh, assessment. Yeah. But uh, Which is not, wants... not uncommon, just so you know. Oh, not that is, okay. Yeah. Uh, but definitely going into a research intensive undergrad, mm -hmm. he has no idea how to how to organize material from what he's researched. Yeah. And, I was and, and, say. and access it later. Yes. So he can Right. And it's not just, it's not the understanding of the information. It's how to organize it and access it. That's the big thing, right? 
Yes. But yes. what happens is he has a, a phenomenal memory. So he actually can write very cogent paragraphs, but mm. he can't cite them because he can't recall where he got anything. So it's a nightmare trying to recreate it. Okay. So I think we need to think about this further. I'm taking some notes um, and I, I'm, I'm going to bring this up with Dan. Uh, it, it may not be Dan that he works with for that <laughs> particularly. Maybe we add some sessions with somebody else. Um, just to kind of figure that part out because I don't want to muddy the waters with what he's doing with Dan because I, you know we want to keep that separate and then we can work on these other pieces at the same time or maybe we do it all together. But let me talk to Dan about it um, and see what we can do. I think that's terrific. Good yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Okay, who's next? Jolene says, can a student access funding for assistive tech at the post-secondary level? Um, hmm, that's a good question. You're talking more assistive access funding for assistive tech. Like, would that be like getting a computer or getting using particular programs um, or like something like the LiveScribe pen? Jolene, are you still with us? Yes, you are. Oh, there she is. I'm allowing you to talk. Hi, Jolene. You can take yourself off mute. Right. Yeah, you are. Hi. I muted myself. Okay. So I um, am an assistive technology teacher at the secondary level, but I'm new at it. So I um, just have a bit of experience under my belt. And my understanding is that they can access um, through the university the ability to get money towards their assistive tech with the difference being CIA equipment at the secondary level remains with the school it belongs to the school board yes. but at yes. the post-secondary level it belongs to the student right so but how do they go about I guess through those um accessibility offices that would be where you'd probably find out but yeah I just I, don't know enough about that myself yet I think that, that that would be my first line of defense. I would go through the accessibility office. I would, um, again, you're going to need a diagnosis of whatever that would mm -hmm. warrant having this assistive technology. And then they would set that up um, either with a bursary maybe for or a grant for that technology yeah. or um, in some other way. <clears throat> That would be my first line of defense. I would go mm -hmm. to the accessibility office because again, every school is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So depending yeah. on which school and which program, but we know for sure that they are gonna need a, a diagnosis that's current. Yes. Yeah. Which is really good information because I've got a lot of grade 11s and 12s and I knew there was something about the diagnosis, but, yeah. but you brought up, I learned a lot from you. So thank oh. you for that. My pleasure. Well, you know what? I would love um, if you have a chance to take a look at our access, our um, assistive technology webinar. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, again, it's like crammed, jam packed uh, with stuff that maybe might be interesting for you as well. What school are you are you working at? I'm in the Lampton Kent. Oh, OK. Great. Yeah, so Sarnia and Chatham area. Yeah. Um, for assistive tech, do you use Read and Write for Google, or is there any particular one that you use? Well, we love Read and Write. We love it. In fact, we've been using Read and Write since it came out. We even um, had connections with the um, with the salespeople. They would come and visit us once a year for a couple of years when they were just getting going, and they mm -hmm. would they would test out their new stuff on us. So, oh, that's awesome. I know. I love Read and Write. And now yeah. with a whole bunch, there's another new suite that they've just come out with um, that I'm just familiarizing myself with. So I'm a big proponent of Read and Write. I like the fact that it's a Google Chrome extension so that you can use it with everything. Yeah. Um, the only disadvantage is that if you're using the extension, you can't, you have to be within Wi-Fi, right? You can't. Yes. Connect, yeah. Right. So, so that's the, the yeah. advantage. But at a university setting, even if you're in a dorm, chances are um, you're, you're going to have access Wi-Fi wherever yeah. you connectivity. are. Connectivity. Exactly. Yeah. And Orbit Note is mm -hmm. pretty is pretty good. And now they they built an scannability feature within Orbit Note in like just the last week. Right. right. Um, yes. So that's awesome. And um, where was my other train of thought? The mom who was talking about her son um, with note taking. 
-hmm. the note taking like if if he's doing it on websites yes there is the ability to highlight within read and write that yeah. would really work well for a kid like that that's right yeah. that's right so the research skills um yeah. using all of those the tools that are available for research skills mm -hmm. Yes. And there are also the aspect when you're highlighting from a website, it will give you the um, it will give you the the URL. It will give you the citation. Yep. The um, click collect. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's yeah. awesome. I'm glad to hear that. I'm, I'm looking forward to looking at your other um, your other information, other webinars and things. So I, I do have one going off to university myself next year and one the year after. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm. I'm one of those moms sitting, <laughs> sitting here going, oh, this is for real. So, yeah. yeah. I know, I know. And I also have a 12 year old, just like you. Ah, so. Well, look at that. Look at that. Go. Fun so, times, right? Fun times. It is. It's good. <laughs> so thank you so much. I look forward to, to looking at some of your other stuff. Marvelous. Well, you know what? I would love your feedback. So, you know, if ever, you know, if you get through <laughs> some of them or you have questions, um, you can send them through to info at Ruth Rumac and just okay. say, pass on to Ruth. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, take care. You too. Who's next? What else have we got going on? Um, da, 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 da. We talked to Caitlin. We talked to Josie. Who's next? Um, otter pen. Christine wants to know yeah. where the otter pen comes from. Okay. And I would say uh, if you Google it, you can, they, you can find it online. Um, Joelle, we might have a website where you can find it. The, they changed the name, so so it's 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 under two different names right now. Um, but if you Google, sorry, it's not the otter pen. Let me rephrase that. The otter is um, a voice transcription software or app where you can talk into it or you can record something and then it will transcribe your words. That's that's the Otter app. The Live Scribe pen is, is the pen that records and then you can write at the same time and then it connects where you're writing and the recording, at, it timestamps it. So there's the Live Scribe pen and then there's Otter app, two separate things. Um, I wonder, I hope, Christine, that makes sense to you. That they're not the same. Um, I'm. Oh, who else is there? There's Christine. Do you have a question? Let's see. Go ahead. I think you can unmute. Hi, Ruth. Um, Junian used to take the course, and my other one, my younger one, in in your your place, which took us a, a different route to to look at different things in different way yes. now he's he's a grade 12 um he's he's um his reading skill is is um not up to date somehow he loves watch um movie rather than reading a book yeah however yeah. so that's why i had uh, so much interest in this auto uh, pen I think he can relate it um, so well with that. He also has an autis autism and also he developed epilepsy lately. So I think his his motor skill is not as as well developed than other people. Yes. Now, um, I'm interested to know more about assist uh, assistive tech. Um, I actually never knew that was a, such a thing that exists that we can we can use. Oh yes, yes. There's a lot of assistive technology available. Um, I every type of need has a different type of assistive technology, and then there are different. There's some sort of wide-reaching programs, like what we were mentioning before, was the read and write, uh, read and write gold, or read and write for Chrome, and it's a, it's. It's software that allows you to do many, many things, including uh, if you have um, something that you want to, a, a PDF, right? You have a, a PDF, you can highlight the words on the PDF and then press talk and it will read it to you. You could also highlight something on a website or on an email or 
anything that shows up on your computer pretty much you can highlight and have the computer read to you so for and and is it julian you're talking about is he the yes. one okay so and yeah. is he going into university for next year mm -hmm. okay so if you contact the um the offices of, of accessibility wherever he's planning on going they they will also be able to give him um like his textbooks, instead of having just the textbook in written form, they should also be able to give him um, a digital form, in which case he can use this software to read it to him. And if he's got good oral skills and he gathers, you know, he's got a good memory for things that he hears, then having it read to him will be much uh, easier than having him read it simply on his own. And also, as he's having the computer read it to him, he can stop it and use a highlighter to highlight certain features in different colors or different notes in different colors. And then he can build his notes uh, with the click of a button instead of having to handwrite them as well. So something like read and write gold will be really helpful for him or read and write because it will give him many different tools to use at once. Okay. For example. So it's something, is, is Julian still with us right now? Is he seeing us right now? No, no, no. So it's possible. You may want to come back for a little while and we can uh, work on the assistive technology and find some solutions that are going to work specifically for him. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk to your, your office then based on what yeah. we had discussed. Yeah, okay. I, I just, you know, he's, he's been struggling so much in school so i can't really add anything more that's why we were yeah. away from it yeah but then um no i'm i was not lost touch with your your office because it's just something that i did not want to lose yeah and and as a parent it's new to me everything is new things are keep changing with the covid it's so difficult yeah yeah for sure okay so, <clears throat> and especially so, if he's developed epilepsy at the same time, that's mm -hmm. that's an extra stress and, and an added layer that that can complicate things too. So I will um, talk to your office and to about the read and write goal. Is that is that the title that should I? What you would ask for is you want to talk to um, the intake team about okay. uh, assistive technology, particularly read and write goal. Okay. Read and write cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Ruth. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your questions. And I hope that we can connect again soon. Okay. Thank okay. you. Bye bye. Bye. Who else have we got? Matt. Every I'm okay. You can put practice. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we've got Matt and we've got Nadine. Do you have any questions? Who's got a question? These are great questions. Can I tell you that you guys are awesome? Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, Matt's still there. Matt, do you have any questions? I can answer them. I'm here. Dun, dun, dun. You can put your hand up. If you want a question or put it in the chat and we'll unmute you. No. Nope. All right. If that's the case, then I'm going to sign off for the evening. But uh, again, get in touch with the office, explain, you know, what you heard through the webinar and uh, if you've got particular questions and then somebody from our intake team who are amazing educators will get back to you and, and get a whole history and try and figure out what it is that uh, your kids need at this time. And then we can take it step by step from there. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. And we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.